first let me do an introduction of the speaker, Mr. Wei Lok. So welcome everybody to today's talk entitled Bridging the Gap, Sustainable Synergy Between Vertical and Outdoor Farming. It is the 35th talk of a series targeting to promote agrobiotechnology and enhance understanding of the potential applications of agricultural products. We hope the series will inspire international scholars, researchers, farmers, and business in the agricultural field, as well as the interested public. Our speaker, Mr. Wei Lok, who is the founder of Full Nature Farms, FNF, is an agricultural, agricultural innovator dedicated to sustainable farming practices. Under his guidance, FNF has pioneered advanced technologies in vertical farming and eco-friendly agriculture. The company FNF excels in producing high quality environmentally conscious produce while continuously exploring new projects to expand agricultural possibilities and address societal needs. In this talk, we will introduce vertical farming Many have viewed it as, an, as the exclusive future of agriculture, leading to a surge in attention and investments in recent years. Regrettably, much of this enthusiasm was fueled by hip and unrealistic expectation. As the bubble deflates rapidly, it's imperative to reassess the role of vertical farming and how its technology and knowledge can be shared with outdoor and greenhouse goers, fostering a mutually beneficial approach. Conversely, it is equally essential to explore how expertise gained from outdoor farming can be applied to enhance indoor farming practices. Without further ado, let's welcome Wei to the floor. Wei, please. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. I'll share my screen first. All right. Um... This should be fine. okay, so it should be working, right? Yes, thanks. Okay, so uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, I'm Ray. Um, second, yep, so I'm Ray, I'm from Hong Kong, born in Hong Kong, and then uh, I got my business degree from the states. So a little bit about me first. So I don't I don't have any agriculture background at all. So I started the whole thing is just based on purely on hobby as a hobby system. Uh, we started ten years ago, and then it, it was pretty random. But anyways, regarding my team, we have currently we have fourteen employees. Half of them are farmers. We have three engineers, and also we have like sales and the accountants and etc. So we have a full team right now. Uh, just for your background, I don't have any agriculture uh, study at all. I only learn all my stuff based on readings, research papers, and uh, from YouTube, obviously. And uh, so my information might be wrong. So everything I'm going to tell you is purely based on my experience from the last 10 years. And um, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. So don't worry. So recently, there's like a lot of news negative news about vertical farming uh, a lot of them are going bankrupt uh, and a lot of them are actually billion dollars company um, they were invested by ikea blackrock uh, microsoft you name it pretty much a lot of them are going bankrupt so you the the future looks bleak for vertical farming but i actually think it's a good time for a reset because previously there's this way too much hype uh, people thought Vertical farming is the only way out for agriculture, which I strongly disagree because I came from a greenhouse background, which I'm going to talk about later. And then I really think there's a lot more potential in vertical farming than most people think. So one of the main challenges about vertical farming is the cost of goods sold. It's way too expensive. So the reason for me, I think the reason is from the engineering problem. Uh, because we do a lot of calculation e estimation based on the design, uh, labor costs, transportation costs, and tax. Also, electricity prices, especially recently, there's like a huge inflation around the world right now. Um, electricity prices killing a lot of uh, vertical farms, especially in Europe. 
So when you have the reason why the retail price is so high for most vertical farms, it's because of the uh, electricity, the setup costs. So with that in mind, either you have to set a really high retail price to maintain the profit margin, or you go with the quantity. Either way, the investors won't be happy. Uh, just for a reference, uh, for a reference, I have like uh, 18 investors right now. So when we have to deal with them, it's pretty, it's not easy, put it this way. It's pretty challenging as well. So one of the, so as I said, it's an engineering problem. It's due to high uh, bed design and it causes high operating costs. So for the, this presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, a lot of, uh, one second. So for this presentation, I'm going to talk about a lot of design issues in most vertical farms these days. And then we're going to talk about my company, Furniture Farms. And now I'm going to tell you how we resolve it. And finally, we can we'll finish off this presentation by suggesting how vertical farms and soil farming can work together to create a better future. So, so don't worry, it's a little bit about engineering. It's mostly about common sense. It's not really too technical, but it's really based on common sense. Um, in vertical farming, it's all about space utilization. Oftentimes vertical farms claim they are more like a hundred times more productive than soil farming or outdoor farming. It's because the space utilization can be really efficient. But look at this, all this, designs across the world. One is from Singapore, one is from Korea, uh, one is from Hong Kong, and then the other one is from the States. The most common issue with vertical farm is that they have too much corridor space. Because in a vertical farm setup, you have to calculate your production volume based on cubic meter, not square meter. It's not like outdoor farming, right? So any empty space you have inside design, it means it's no, there's no production. You're just paying for rent, you're just paying for air. So it's not worth it. It's a waste of space. And uh, yeah, well, you're just paying rent for nothing. So this is the most common design. Like the one in the middle right now, you can see half of the space, it's empty. It means there's no production at all. So with that in mind, they are losing productivity right away. So that's space utilization. Next is all about LED technology. A lot of companies got wrong with LED technologies because they blindly trust the suppliers. For, from the supplier's point of view, all they want is that you can meet their MOQ, the minimum ordering quantity, and buying their lights with the highest profit margin, which means they will always try to sell you the old technology, outdated technology. The most common ones are like this one, the pink light, we call it the purple, because when you mix blue and uh, the red spectrum, it becomes purple, right? So this is some technology from like 20 years ago. Uh, back then, the LED lights were still inefficient and uh, they were unable to produce the spectrum between the blue and the red spectrum, like the green and uh, yellow. So they often tell you in photosynthesis, you only need, you only, it only requires red and the blue spectrum. The rest is irrelevant. But as time goes on, as more research comes out, as based on common sense, we need a full spectrum. So that's one, one of the issue with uh, LED lights. Second of all is like people buy LED lights for, for a middleman, which means the cost is extremely high. With that in mind, CapEx is higher, the installation cost is higher, and uh, so the return is slower. Oftentimes mm -hmm. those farm owners or operators, they have no knowledge about LED lights. They simply trust the manufacturers. It's one of the reasons why uh, a lot of uh, vertical farms go bankrupt. As long as you do pink lights or the purple lights, uh, it's quite likely they're going down. Another issue is that a lot of lights are not dimmable. It means they are always running at 100% output. For example, even when the plants in germination stage or even in a seedling stage when they're tiny, the lights are always still produce 100% output. It means you're wasting a lot of energy. So dimmable for me is a very important. And by also running at a lower output, it means there's less heat load, and it means you can uh, you have you can consume less power, and there's less loading on the air conditioning. So everything pretty much adds up. And also, a lot of lights cannot be cleaned. It means they are not waterproof. Uh, it means it's quite likely they're gonna break down. And uh, in the states, a lot of vertical farms purchase light purchase the lights locally from the states. Uh, they're 
cost of the lights, similar lights from China is around four to five times cheaper, at least for me, is at least four to five times cheaper. So uh, if you what got your LED lights wrong, it means you're wasting a lot of money. And oftentimes LED, it's around, costs you around 40% of your budget. So it really adds up really fast. So these days, also the newer LED lights are shifting towards the full spectrum already. Uh, and then it, it makes a huge difference, which I'm gonna explain later. And then there's another thing about LED design is about the integration. For example, here, when the LED lights are placing so far away from the plant, it means it's quite inefficient. Oftentimes we use PPFD as a metric to measure the light's efficiency. For lattice, you probably need around 250, but with this, this, this design on the top right, uh, the PPFD is probably only at around 90. It means they can produce a head of lattice uh, in 30 days at around 90 to 120 grams, which is pretty, pretty limited. And then by compared to outdoor farming, that's pretty much nothing at all. So, and also they have to make sure in the LED design, they have to make sure there's right uh, spectrum inside it, which means you have to make sure there's enough right spec uh, red spectrum, blue spectrum, and the red rest of the spectrum as well. And when you have done an even spectrum, it, the leaves, it's quite likely they're gonna elongate. Again, most companies are trying to sell you all these pink lights uh, because they are cheapest to produce and uh, the light dials are available everywhere. A full spectrum lights like this ones, they are usually more efficient. Uh, they cost more, but then the operating cost is also lower. And yeah, it, it's quite likely you will be able to produce much uh, bigger plant within a short period of time. Oh, by the way, one, one of the thing is that a lot of measurements done by these LED suppliers are not trustworthy. Uh, the certificate is quite likely fake or they make some numbers up. And then uh, a lot of farm operators have no idea how to verify it. You have to buy a really expensive meter just to measure the, the data. So that's one thing. Next is about the control and automation. A lot of companies are wasting a lot of time on money and time on automation. We waste quite a bit of money as well. For example, in early stages of our vertical farm, we spend around 400,000 Hong Kong dollar on the PLC, Programmable Logic Controller, and another $600,000 on the software part. And so total, it costs us a million dollars just to do something really basic, like monitoring the water flow, temperature, control the fan, the LED outputs, scheduling, some really basic stuff, but somehow it costs so much because PLC has been around for so long. And um, it is the industrial standard. PLC is often used in elevators, trains, um, or airplanes, uh, manufacturing. This is the most common way to automate something. But PLC is also something from, uh, so something from like 20 or 30 years ago. They are not designed for complicated instructions or programming. So oftentimes there's a lot of issues and um, they are really expensive. PLC, the market is dominated by major players like Mitsubishi, Siemens, and Panasonic. And they oftentimes it costs a lot more than you think. And then there's always a hidden cost It's called the deployment cost, uh, AKA the wiring cost. Because every sensors, there are like two K, two wires for signaling, two wires for power. It means you have at least four wires per sensors. You'll be run, running a lot of wire, wires around the farm just to monitor something really basic like the temperature or humidity. So that cost adds up really fast. For, for, imagine you have a really big farm, like 10 acres, and then you have a bunch of wires running around. So the cost adds up really fast. Uh, PLC is something people don't want to address because the market size is limited. By comparatively by compared to other electronic products. And um, they also consume a lot of power. So you cannot power it by solar. You cannot uh, power by it by batteries. It has to be connected to a, a main, uh, main socket. So that's one thing. And then software is always limited. It always a limited factor that I'm going to explain uh, in a bit. So with that in mind, we came to conclude that PLC is not the right solution for automating any type of farm. And... Uh, to be honest, a lot of times the PSC systems are designed by consultants. Consultants prefer to make money uh, instead of giving you like a cheap and uh, efficient solution. 
So, oh, so in the photos uh, here, you see those pointing, those are all PLC boxes. Each of them costs you at least 10 or 20,000 Hong Kong dollar easily. And then you, when you add up the installation costs, uh, the costs keep going up and up and up. So previously in a small farm, we have deployed over seven, 700 sensors inside the farm. And we realized debugging is a main issue because it's so hard to trace the wire. And then you realize it's actually not the wiring issue. It was the sensor itself is defected. So that wasted us a lot of time and money. And then we realized it's not a scalable solution. In PLC, you're often stuck with their own software. Like this one is by Siemens. Um, there's uh, There are different levels of their software. The top level is the UI, the control interface, and then there's the logic, and then there's the automation uh, software. You have to add everything together in order to make it work. Every slight changes in your UI or the design, or if you want to add a sensor, the backend has to be completely modified, including the database, uh, the hardware, and everything. You might have to add even more modules into it, and oftentimes it causes you even more headaches because oftentimes there's always, always problems. Uh, so this PLC software, they also, they always work, but the thing is they are quite kind of slow. They are not designed for IOT or something more advanced in automation. And you have to subscribe to soft, their software. So it adds up the cost. If you want to change your coding, you have to talk to them again. So the cost goes, goes up really fast. That's why a lot of farms quite don't like to use PLC, but they don't have choices as well. In also because PLC is a very independent software. You can combine it with your inventory control, invoicing, flat planning, or farm management. It's, there's no integration between it. So the cost is pretty high. And a lot of vertical farms, somehow they like to use soil in vertical farm. Not like I'm anti-soil, but in a vertical farm format, using soil is pretty hard to automate and they're really heavy. So it affects the loading, it increases the workload and oftentimes they have pest issues. Once the pests get into the soil, I think you guys are more familiar than I do, there's a spread out really fast. There's no way you can control it. Uh, but then soil is the easiest way to do it in soil farming. So a lot of people like to use it. Uh, but on the other hand, after you're done with soil, you have to disinfect it or something, or you go to compost and it takes up more space. In vertical farming, space is everything. So uh, I don't think using vertical, uh, using soil in vertical farming is a smart choice. And also a lot of times soil, will clog the water pipe and causing even more issues. This is one of the more common mistakes in vertical farm. So here we'll talk a little bit about operation. Um, uh, somehow a lot of vertical farms they ignore the operation. The, the difficulties about operation is that designing a good operation system is that the designer or the engineers himself, he's not a farmer. So he, they don't understand how complicated how repetitive farm work is. Sometimes it's just annoying or sometimes it just has to be done and engineers often don't really focus on it. That's why uh, there's a lot of miscommunication between the farmers and the off farm operators. And um, like this one on the top right, it's called Zipgrow. It's the, one of the most common uh, vertical farm system uh, in the world. But as you can see on the bottom right, it takes a lot of time just to clean up the the grow pipe. It's heavy. Uh, you have to do disinfection like what they're doing right now. And they just use a high pressure hose to clean it, which means it's going to use even more water. And then you have to clean the grow pipe again. It just go on and on and on. So we used it before. We realized it's pretty dumb. So we're not going back again. So again, if you see people using zip grow in their system, it's quite likely they are used, spending a lot of time on maintenance instead of growing. Uh, like on the other hand, a lot of farms like to use this uh, lift. Uh, scissor lift. Scissor lifts are pretty expensive. Like one of them, there's one of these, this costs you at least 300,000 Hong Kong dollar. And then you have to pay for the maintenance fee and then you have to pay for the training. And you have to hope your workers won't crash it into the farming system because it's dangerous. And then not, not, not only it costs more, and then you have to pay, you have to, a few of them for backup. The farm in the middle, like this one, they use ladder. Uh, one of the issue with ladder is that when you carry heavy stuff, it's really not safe. Uh, a lot of times, insurance won't cover cover this kind of uh, insurance. They don't, they don't, they don't want to deal with it. So these are some of the red flags with vertical farms. And also on the other hand, 
a lot of vertical farms have a lot of fancy technology. They love to use AGVs. They love to move stuff around. Uh, they think that that's the future of farming. I mean, it looks good for to investors, but in reality, a lot of times they are quite useless. Uh, a lot of times you can move it faster by yourself than compared to using an AGV. So these are fancy attacks that are good to have, but unnecessary. Uh, personally, uh, in terms of automation, I think seedlings, processing, packaging, and transplanting are the best ones to have, but the rest are pretty much optional, like robotic arms. Robotic arms, they, they require a lot of maintenance. Uh, they don't like to deal with water, and then you had need a lot more space for it to move around. With robotic arms, you usually need a few of them to be standing by, and then also you want them you're gonna you want to have an engineer standby as well. So your cost adds up really fast. In Hong Kong, this kind of stuff they don't work in Hong Kong because you don't have we don't we simply don't have enough space to be honest. And uh yeah, space is luxury in Hong Kong. So yeah, at the end of the day, whenever you invest in fancy technology, the main question is that does it really help to improve yield or does it cut down the labor cost? And obviously we can talk about other topics like NFT, vertical growth pipes, uh, the water culture, et cetera. And every, each of them make a huge difference. Personally, we have a much better experience with vertical growth pipes uh, because of the airflow, mainly because of the airflow and the heat distribution is a lot better. Like look at the one on the right is by plenty. The one on the left is by Aer Aero Farms. Uh, in Aero Farms, the heat is always trapped below the uh, the the level above. So the air circulation requires more fan to push the air around. It means you use more energy. And the humidity control is a lot more difficult in a uh, stacked setup. But on a vertical setup, the air hot air simply goes up and uh, it's a lot easier to circulate air in a vertical setup as well. So, and also because the water consistently drips through the grow pipe, it means uh, more aeration, the plants grow faster. You, it's likely you have less fungi issues and uh, it has less loading on the building as well. So everything adds up in from a design perspective. But on the other hand, as long as the design doesn't work in Hong Kong, it doesn't work for us. Uh, so for us, we have to design a system dedicated for vertical farming, suitable for Hong Kong, for small areas and, and short ceilings. Uh, one of the one really important factor for us is that we have to make sure the system is scalable. Uh, if it's not scalable, I think it's irrelevant as well. Anything that's one off in a what any design that's one off, we think it's irrelevant. So at the end of the day, we are growing lettuce, right? We are growing a leafy greens. Uh, so our metrics is like, how much does it cost per head of lettuce? Uh, what's the harvest weight and how many days? These are the three main factors that we look at. And we have to understand that most of the electricity, uh, most of the cost goes to electricity. If the cost is too high, it means we have to go back to the design design flow again. So again, it is an energy engineering problem. Um, the one of the main issue with this is that a lot of design cannot be changed. Like let's say if you got the wrong LED lights, right? You already spent all the money on the LED lights, and it doesn't make sense to replace it. And but then you don't have the competitive advantage, right? So you lose it. Uh, it, it pretty much lose right away. It's game over for everyone. So, so here are the takeaways from the above slides. Engineering, design, construction, manufacturing, execution, and constant R&D. All the effort spent on this in this area is just to create a cheaper product, a product that's that's highly affordable. If you make a mistake in the design concept, it's pretty much game over. A lot of vertical farms shut down because they did something wrong in one of these areas. And I see most of them are at the engineering side, especially with LED lights. And on the other hand, engineers are not farmers and they are not investors. Each of these individual, they have different goals. So you have to align them, make sure they are on the same page or else, again, it's going to be chaos again. Finally, is that you have to identify your product, your farm. Are you selling vegetables or are you selling a dream? Yeah. Uh, selling a dream is different because you can uh, you can bluff a lot, but when you're selling vegetables, it's pretty solid. It is, something is pretty grounded. You can't make numbers up with uh, when, once, he's, once your idea is like selling vegetables. And now we'll talk about a little bit about our farm. Our farm is furniture farms. Uh, we started in 2013, 
it was 10, almost 10 years ago. As I have said before, we started based on a hobby. Uh, it was out of curiosity. Uh, there was a day I went to the supermarket and realized vegetables are so expensive in Hong Kong. So I decided to grow my own vegetables. And uh, somehow I got into this whole farming thing. We started experimenting with hydroponics, soil farming. And then we realized soil farming works really well. And it, the flavor is, was clearly better than hydroponics in many ways. And But then the cost is really high. That's why we looked at into aquaponics. And then back then, 10 years ago, people still didn't believe in aquaponics for, it was a lot more like a hobby system. They don't think it's a scalable solution, nor it is, it's doable in a larger scale. So, but anyway, we thought that, it's an interesting design and concept. So we flew to the States, we took some classes and got back, bought a small piece of land, and then we did our own uh, aquaponics farm. It was 25,000 square feet. For the first few years, it was more for R&D. We got lucky. Uh, we have a few thousand fish, and then we had grown over 500 varieties of crops. Everything grows like from watermelon, heirloom tomatoes, herbs, lettuce, Asian greens, uh, you name it, pretty much everything grows really well in aquaponics. Back then, our business model was like a B2C business model. People buy subscription and then we deliver once a week. But unluckily, in 2017, we Hong Kong was really affected by the climate change. It got really hot. It rains a lot. It was always cloudy. And then in 2018, the, the whole greenhouse was destroyed by the super typhoon uh, back then. It was like 10 years ago. Uh, 2018, insurance didn't cover our damage. And then we realize our business is directly related to climate change and climate change is really real. But we decided not to give up. Um, back then, luckily, we met some other co-founders and then we fundraised this new company called Full Nature Farms. Since then, we've been focusing on indoor farming. Uh, the facility is pretty small. It is only 3,500 square feet. Uh, suppose the purpose was to R&D about vertical farming technology before we scale up. But since we started right before the social protest and then followed up by COVID, so it pushed us to do focus on indoor farming. We focus on uh, doing production in a tiny facility and try to make it profitable. So these are the photos from our farm. As you can see, they look quite different. This is the fish tank. And then we have developed quite a few different systems since then. Our business model is pretty straightforward. We just grow microgreens, edible flowers, and lettuce. We sell to the, oh, oh yes, we changed it to the B2B business model because we realized B2B is a lot more sustainable. We can deal a lot less, uh, a lot less issues from the customer service point of view, and they are more consistent. Uh, right now, our products is also selling at uh, retailers as well. Another, because of the technology development, we came up with another, business model is called technology transfer. We are recently, we have built two farms for the vegetable marketing organization in Hong Kong. Uh, EMSD has also used our technology to deploy in their project. We also set up uh, different projects for a uh, different farm set up for private companies and other universities. So the reason why we use aquaponics is we realize in aquaponics, the nutrient spectrum is quite wide because uh, we rely on fish, uh, fish waste. Aquaponics is, we create an ecosystem between fish, bacteria, and veggies. We let them grow. And then we require the bacteria to convert nitrate to nitrate and also extracting nutrients from the fish waste that the plant absorbs. Excess nutrient goes back, to, uh, excess water or nutrient goes back to the fish tank and that completes one cycle. One of the surprising findings from aquaponics is that during the nitrification process, uh, the pH actually goes low. So as long as you have the right amount of, right ratio of amount of fish, bacteria, and veggies, the system can balance itself quite easily. You don't, we don't really have to adjust the pH at all. Uh, the only downside with aquaponics is that there's not, there's always iron deficiency. So we had to add extra from the system. In our farm, we are, have, we have around a thousand tilapia right now. And then we are, it's supporting 28,000 heads of uh, pots of flowers, edible flowers, because uh, flowers use less, a lot energy and input. So we can use less fish to grow. Another uh, interesting finding for us is that because we have begun working with universities, we realize in our water, there's hundreds, like over 200 varieties of bacteria. They are all beneficial bacteria. They are not harmful to fish or the, to the plants. It actually helps their immune system. And then we also realize with the higher the biodiversity, the better the plants grow. 
So uh, just for a comparison, we realized our system uh, actually grow around two to three times more produce compared to similar hydroponic setup within the same space. So in Hong Kong, why vertical farming is necessary? I guess you guys are quite familiar with the recent heavy rain uh, from last month. Uh, there's a lot of flooding, high humidity, extreme temperatures, pest issues. As you know, right? in high humidity, you have a lot of fungi issues and it causes a lot of pest issues as well. And one of the main challenges is land. Land is really expensive in Hong Kong. And oftentimes you will have to deal with a lot of villages issues or a lot of political issues. So this is quite difficult for us to scale up. So it's one of the reasons why we are moving to indoor. Also, we re also realize our customers buy from us are due to ESG reasons. Listed companies, they have an ESG report to hand in. Buying local farms actually help them. So it's one of the reasons why vertical farming is necessary in Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, the winter is way too short right now. Even during the winter, uh, the temperature is always above like 24 degrees these days. So the winter is too short. And as you know, lettuce or most types of leafy greens prefer temperature between 16 to 22 degrees or 23 degrees, right? Anything about 24 degrees, they, they start to elongate, they start bolting too early or the flavors just get too bitter. So vertical farming, I think it's the only way for Hong Kong but not necessary for other countries. But being local, like, like hotels decided to buy from us is because of the long shelf life, ESG reasons, and they really look at the carbon footprint. Obviously we use electricity from coal, but then because we are so close to the our sub-customers, instead of flying thousands of kilometers to Hong Kong, we, we're only 20 kilometers from them. So our carbon footprint is quite a bit lower compared to the import of food. Also because there's no wastage, 100% of our produce can be used it, they're quite willing to switch. Again, it's ESG friendly, our price are consistent, and also our, our produce comes with all kinds of certificate requests from, 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 um, from our customers. Well, so for the past few years, we have developed over 12 different versions of the vertical setup. We realize it's really challenging and we keep trying to improve uh, our designs. So recent, so lately we have developed this, I'm gonna go over this one quickly. So we have developed our own system to make sure it's compatible with hydroponic, aquaponics, and also we've been adding bacteria from, uh, from the soil to add it to the system. We actually see pretty quick big differences in terms of yield and the health, health condition of our plants. Uh, so this is the setup. Uh, it's a vertical setup. It's modular. Uh, it's dedicated for lettuce only. And I would like to talk about the LED lights as well. Just for your comparison, uh, like 10 years ago, to grow a head of lettuce, it quite 20 watts per hour. But these days, it's all down to, for us, it's less than six watts to grow a head of lettuce per hour. So you can see that the, the, the energy reduction is quite big. And for the, in terms of light spectrum, 10 years ago, we could only use the red and blue spectrum. And then a few years later, we mix it with a little bit of white spectrum. Now we have wet spectrum of far red, deep blue, uh, UV, et cetera. So it really depends on how tailor-made we want the lights to be and what type of crops that we grow. We also realize if we want the leafy greens to be extra red, a bit of UV always help. So again, these are the full spectrum lights so, uh, that's pretty common in the market right now. This is the most common spectrum. It's made by Samsung. Uh, it's called 301H or something. Uh, it's the most popular uh, spectrum uh, in the world right now. They grow really well. And then we also realized the green spectrum is extra useful when you have high density canopy because it allows the green spectrum to penetrate to the lower leaf. And as a result, the plants grow quite a bit faster. Oh, so the latest trend is far red or infrared. Far red, it tricks the plants to be a long summer during the sunset. So uh, it, they grow somehow a little bit faster. Uh, so because of that, we've been getting, we, we have more inquiries on buying our lights. So we have begin selling our lights to other customers as well. And one of the most important achievement for us is able to automate the system by using our own in-house technology. We create this little control board, it's called Atoms. It's a standalone little computer uh, 
we can connect all type of sensors on it. And then because it's so cheap to make, we can deploy it in many places uh, because it's wirelessly connected. We don't have to deal with the wiring issues. So the cost is quite a bit lower. Oh uh, yeah, it's got Adam. So the way we connect it, we can connect to water pumps, uh, water meters, EC meters, pH, temperature sensors, all type of sensors that you can think of, just connect it to the atoms, and then it will send the signal to our server, do analyzing or control or scheduling. So uh, the software is open source, it's easy to use, everyone can modify it. We've been also supplying the system to universities and the different government departments. Again, because we don't have to deal with wiring, we skip all the wiring costs. Uh, the cost is quite significantly lower compared to traditional uh, PLC or automation setup. Because of the, the board is pretty tiny, it's uh, like palm size. So you reduce on the size, so image is a lot easier to deploy it. Again, it saves cost and save space. The server, you can just buy a cheap server to host it. It costs you around 1,000, 2,000 RMB each uh, compared to like a 40 or 50,000 server from there. Uh, just to give you a quick summarize, this is pretty important because we are able to deploy our own control board to replace a PLC. The automation cost for us is significantly lower now. That's our main competitive advantage. And because based on our system, uh, the whole system that you saw just now, we are able to grow lettuce up to 500 grams within 40 day cycle, which is pretty good for indoor farming. Uh, but then, because look at the lettuce, it's way too big. It's bigger than a watermelon. You can't even fit it in the fridge. So we are sticking with a 20 to 30 day cycles. In 30 days, in with a vertical setup, we can uh, achieve around 200 to around 200 to 300 grams of lettuce, uh, which is comparable to outdoor farming. But because we are doing it indoor, so it's pretty consistent as well. The cost is quite cheap as well. Uh, it's quite comparable to China imports uh, these days. Uh, so I think we're quite competitive in that way. So because of that, we also joined the Science Park recently. They are pushing our control system to other industries. So it really diversify our business model. So again, we're building farms in uh, for universities in Hong Kong. We are setting up a new tomato research setup for a company in Europe. And also it's also for a Hong Kong farm. We are also expanding to a bigger farm to 10,000 square feet. Uh, remember, as we said, because our farm is quite modular, so it's really easy to, for us to calculate the cost and also to scale up to other factories or empty warehouses. So how can we apply the knowledge from soil farming into vertical farming? Uh, you have to understand that in vertical farming, most of them are hydroponics. In hydroponics, they have a lot of limitation and oftentimes they have their own theory, they are quite they just don't want to change. In some ways, they just want to deal with the MPK solutions and keep it easy. But then for us, we realized after aquaponics is actually quite similar to soil farming in many ways. You know, in terms of biodiversity, microbes, the nutrient spectrum, uh, the complexity behind it is actually quite interesting for me. And that's why we've been focusing a lot more on the bacteria side uh, for the last 12 months, and we are seeing really promising results. So for us, it's more for faster growth rates, higher yields, using less input, less resources, and thus the cost is lower. So it makes it really competitive in that, in that sense. Personally, I think the biochemical reaction part is the most difficult for, for me to understand because uh, I don't have any background in this area at all. And also we, uh, we also re came to realize that photosynthesis is actually a very complicated matter. Uh, even like a slight shift of spectrum can really affect the plant taste, the flavor and the yield, the, the thickness of the leaf and the texture of it. So vertical farms don't like to use uh, the knowledge from soil farming is because of a design issue. They love to use UV light for dis disinfection. As you know, once we begin to use UV light, it destroys the, the structure of the nutrients. Uh, it kills off the bacteria. It destroys the, the biodiversity. And, but the whole purpose is to for disinfection and prevent the formation of algae. Because when, once they have algae, it's, uh, it's likely they're going to clog their pipe because their pipe is really narrow. It clog, clog their pump. So that's why they have to use UV lights. And sometimes they even use ozone, which is even worse than UV lights for the bacteria. 
And in hydroponic setup, they have to flush out their water every three weeks or every cycle. It means the whole the whole bacteria population is gone. And then a lot of times I remember like 10 years ago when I was visiting a lot of trade shows in Europe, especially in the ones in uh Amsterdam in Netherlands, when they 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 really hate the idea of using bacteria inside hydroponics. Uh they don't believe in that. They just believe in a pure MPK and typical hydroponic setup with the typical nutrient mix. So I think this is one of the reasons why hydroponics have been stuck in the same stage for a very long time. Not that they don't work, it's just that there's pretty hard for them to improve. So how can vertical farming technology be integrated into like a traditional setup or soil-based farming? Personally, I think it's the sensors. And uh, sensors are quite important because it's allow you to collect a lot of data and then make sense of uh, what's going on under the soil or above the soil. Uh, oftentimes, we all, we can only observe through we can only learn or understand through observation. But with Stanter, or with Caesar, you can collect a lot of data and then you can analyze it. These days, with ChatGPT or those kind of AI models available, it's really easy for us to analyze. Like the plant health, is there like any dehydration or is there any pest issues? It's pretty easy to do it this is, and you can do it relatively cheap as well. And then with remote monitoring, the farmers can sleep in peace at night. And then sometimes you can even do germination in indoor, for example. We actually do some germination uh, work for a lot of a few, not a lot, a few uh, outdoor farms in Hong Kong for their tomatoes uh, because we realized they realized Germany thing in indoor it actually helps a lot and uh, it takes a lot less risk as well. So also one of the main strength of indoor farming is automation. Uh, they are really experienced it. So I think this kind of know-how technology can be applied into outdoor farming as well. Again, the objective is the same, is for better yield, higher, lower cost, and uh, using less resources. Sorry. So next is going to be... So we talked to a lot of traditional outdoor farmers as well. Uh, they just don't want to apply their technology, which is new technology or IoT designs. It's mainly because they don't know where to start. Uh, there are too many... Uh, there are simply too many uh, suppliers around the world. And uh, we actually went for a lot of supplies before to, to be able to look at the right ones. And also, one second. Also, a lot of softwares from these supplies are really buggy and unreliable. We, we went through that. Uh, it's pretty bad. And the customer service are often terrible. The deployment is also another issue. Imagine you are in an outdoor farm. You have hundreds of acres of farmland how many sensors you have to deploy, right? Uh, so that's an issue, that's a challenge. And back in the days, uh, outdoor sensors are tend to be quite expensive and unreliable as well. Again, also there's maintenance issues. In maintenance, because uh, sensors oftentimes require calibration, recalibrations. So uh, uh, you, farmers you usually don't have time for it. Uh, they're too lazy or they just don't know how, right? So maintenance is another issue. And we also realized that, especially on Taobao, there's a lot of scams on sensors. Uh, usually they don't work. <laughs> and or you, or you, they work for a few months and they die. Somehow it just worked like that way. And sensors are quite expensive, especially the ones from Europe. Uh, some of the really ghetto ones, some cheap ones, temperature, something like a temperature sensor, they may charge you 700 euro for no reason. And then farmers, sometimes they just buy it because they, they, they trust them. So. Again, I think a lot of farmers refuse to change because of bad, previous uh, bad experience. And also, even if they can obtain data, it doesn't mean they can improve their yield. So I think it's one of the reasons why uh, a lot of farmers are quite hesitant to change. So for us, um, if we can make it more affordable, more widely available, and more education, it will be better for everyone. So to summarize, this topic, uh, just for a very generic summary, I really think farmers and engineers should work together uh, instead of setting their own, doing their own stuff. Farming is a very backward industry by comparison. There's a lot of inf uh, innovation from the DNA, from the uh, 
genetic uh, modification areas, uh, bacteria, but not really in the census part. So I think this is something that we can work together uh, to deploy more technology so we can get more data to, we can share more know-how and then it will make the world like, a little bit better in that way sense. So this is the summary of my presentation. Just let me know if you have any questions or yeah, just let me know. Thank you very much, Wei. Uh, before we take up the questions, uh, maybe we should take a pictures together. So <laughs> I invite everybody to uh, turn on your camera. Yeah, so that uh, we can take a screenshot of scene sort of our, our photos here. Hi, everyone. Now you see everyone, yeah? <laughs> All right, so um, let's, let's, let's start the discussion maybe first answering a question uh, from the chat box. So I think this is a very commonly asked question. So when you are using uh, indoor farming, you consume electricity that's frequent coming from fossil fuel. While you're doing open, uh, open land cultivation, you're using sunlight to do photosynthesis. So why, 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 why should we use the indoor? I, I guess uh, we will have to answer for this uh, first question. Yes. Uh, so before we switch to indoor farming, you we've been using, uh, we've been in a greenhouse for four years. So we know the challenges uh, with uh, outdoor farming. The main challenge in Hong Kong is the temperature. When you have such a high temperature, there's no way you can use the sun to grow stuff. Uh, like today, right? It was like, I think it was like 30 something degrees during since 7 a.m. So it means all the plants going to be dead by the end of the day, or they will, it won't even survive for the next few days. So in order to justify it, we have to make sure uh, our energy consumption is as low as possible. And then when we compare it to imported food, our food is 100% usable. When you buy food, from, let's say is let's say you're a food importer, around 30 to 50% of your food is wasted. So you pay a lot. You are actually paying a lot more on the logistic costs, which means you're paying a lot more on transportation costs, which are associated with around 30% of the carbon global carbon emission. So we, although we are using energy, but we're using less and more efficiently. So that's how we justify our usage of energy. Yeah, so I would like to supplement a little bit because uh, we are always uh, limited in the uh, arable lands. Yep. So because uh, our population is growing, so the, the land is with good soil has been uh, reduced. And secondly, when using open field to to grow the vegetables and other plants, you, the, the consumption of water is usually higher because you've got the evaporation problem and others that you waste a lot of water. So with the limitation of water and land, that that pose uh, constraints to agriculture. So some degree of uh, indoor farming, especially those near the urban city, could be a supplementary to the uh, open area farm. That, that's yeah. I want to supplement. Yeah, and also we have actually a project in Saudi Arabia going on right now. So I mean, it's a desert, right? How can you grow vegetables other than indoor farming? So uh, it's like 50 degrees when I was visiting there. There's no, even a human can survive. So we can't even talk about vegetables, right? So they're relying 100% uh, from imports, 99% or 98%, I can't remember. But then uh, the carbon, but then it really affects the food security issues. That's why they are shifting to indoor farming these days. Yeah, I guess one of the, uh, sorry, uh, let me supplement a little bit before Albert asks your question. <laughs> so I, I guess uh, during the, over the last uh, 10 to 20 years, the, the, the technology advancement has, has, has been uh, very important first to, to have a better insulation so that uh, the, the loss of uh, energy is much less in, in those uh, uh, indoor farming. And second, the, um, uh, the, the more efficient air conditioning and lighting that, that can use less energy. I think that has been a very important focus in research that enabling future uh, indoor farming. So I, I have uh, I have Albert who raised your hand. So maybe Albert, you, you first, yeah. Well, I saw two questions. So the first question is that of course AI, 
artificial intelligence. I see a lot of the stuff, but I never even see the AI being mentioned in all your slides. So, so that's number one question. I do think the AI really have the corridor space and everything. So the second question is that when I see a lot of new device, I'm a patent attorney by training. I'm a biologist by heart. But then I see a lot of novelty and non obviousness there. I do think that they, you have a very strong intellectual property position in a lot of stuff that you just mentioned in all your slides. In fact, that I can tell you, we're looking at your slide, I can find five to 10 patents. I saw <laughs> these are my okay. two questions. Okay. Uh, so we actually use a little bit of AI in the farm but we realize it's not too useful for us because the plant is quite, the environment The environment is pretty consistent. So the yield is pretty consistent as well. So we, we have tried to use AI to monitor the plants, but it really doesn't make a lot of differences for us. And uh, we also don't, do not have a lab for research on how the microbes and all those other stuff. So for now we're skipping AI, but then we have a little bit of AI. But, 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 but yeah. Ray, I might mean, do like yeah. ponder, right? Because the AI can help you to calculate even your indoor, all the plan. When I see your letters, yeah. I am a big letter seeder. Okay. But, 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 but my primary physics is to say that my, my Dodge kitchen, you, mm. your letters is not going to help you the fiber and everything. But I like letters. I like the texture and everything. But with mm. AI, you calculate right? every time the, the letters breathe. Yeah, I just find it amazing. I'm a, a yeah. law firm. I'm more than fifty professional like lawyers, and together with staff, I'm 150 people. But with <laughs> okay. AI, I can basically monitor everybody. When do they really go to the bathroom? Yeah. <laughs> how do they really <laughs> I just feel amazed by yeah. how much AI can do. But 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 that's my little supplement, or right? whatever. With the yeah. brief of your plan, right? With the AI, Ooh. you it's a touch your fingertip when I hit the chat PGPT. Yeah. In two seconds, I got a result, right? So go ahead. So in our farm, uh, we are using this mobile shelf system. We realize it's really difficult for us to integrate a camera into the mobile shelf system and sing all of the plants in one go. So we have to in integrate the mo motor system into the mobile shelf system. And that was pretty challenging for us. And it's quite expensive too. So we, will, we may do it next time, but not in this farm. Yeah. Okay. IP, oh, yeah. intellectual property. Yes, <laughs> uh, we are working on one right now uh, because we can't afford the other IPs yet. <laughs> so we are only working on one IP right now. So I have a big debate with Professor Lamb. So in like maybe 20 years ago, he said, I just will do the common goods, right? Yep. Then I say, my daughter Lamb, you don't have to charge everybody, but if <laughs> you don't serve your right, right? There's a lot of reach or whatever. So Americans, I'm American, so, so Americans are very practical. If you don't have any IP, I can't work with you, yep. right? So because yep. you donated the public. And so the, the beauty about IP is that you can use it if it's deemed necessary. Yep, exactly. And uh, if our investors request that too, that's why we're working on it right now. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you, well, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Albert. Um, I think Josephine has a follow-up question. So Josephine, do you want to ask the question yourself? Oh, oh so yes, we tried it quite no, a few. Necessary. I think I've written my uh, okay. question uh, on, uh, on the chat box. Okay, then we can answer okay. the question, yes. Okay, so we actually tried all type of crops. Uh, uh, we tried the 500 crops, to be honest. We So pretty much during the summer, only fruit plants like watermelons, uh, yin choy, and some, a few varieties of crops grow well during the summer. But most types of leafy greens, they don't really work well. And also, also like climate smart agriculture, I'm not sure if they work. Regenerative farming works. But in Hong Kong, because we don't have enough land, I can't really test it. I can't even obtain a so, license. So, so, Ray, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt, but Yin sure. Choi is my favorite stuff. Oh, really? I, I, can't, I cannot get it in the United States. So every time I go to China or Hong Kong, yeah. I was just like, Gam Nguan Dan Yin Choi. Yeah. Right? So I, I can eat it every day. But anyway, <laughs> I'll stop, I stop talking because he's it. Josephine is asking the question, but Yin Choi is a good choice. Yeah. So we really like regenerative farming. Ideally, we would like to have like an aquaponics setup 
that grow like black soldier flies, uh, snails, those kind of stuff, escargot, uh, create a closed loop system. But in Hong Kong, it's extremely difficult for us. It's mainly because of the humidity. Once you have a high humidity, you have too much pest issues and then it ruins the whole ecosystem. Uh, inside greenhouse also doesn't work because a greenhouse it actually creates a, another greenhouse effect. It was a very dumb mistake for us. I thought greenhouse, it means a house was green in green color, but it actually creates a greenhouse effect. In Hong Kong, when outside is 35 degrees, inside a greenhouse is over 40 degrees. Nothing really grows over 40 degrees. Um, so for countries like in like us in Hong Kong or in subtropical zone or tropical zone, I personally I think indoor farming is more efficient. It's more, much more scalable from a business point of view, but uh, otherwise I don't think it's doable in a business sense. Yeah. Uh, okay. Also, we try to do a different type of plants. We really can't find a lot of them. Okay. Yeah. Well, then we turn to a Hilda's question. So I think the Hilda's question is also in the chat box about the microbes. So wait, do you have any insights on that? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, so we have a lot of biofilm. We don't, we never remove the biofilm in our system. Uh, we actually realize that benefit to the plants. Uh, you can see biofilm in our deep water culture system, in our vertical grow pipes, in our fish, especially a lot in the fish tank. Um, we don't remove it. We we simply change the mechanical design. We use a bigger pipe. We use a different type of pump. Uh, usually in hydroponics, they use a pump called, I think it's a with a diaphragm in it, but we, we don't use those. Uh, without using those pump, that means even bigger solids like biofilm can go through the pump without issues. Okay, I hope this answer Hilda's question. So any other question from the audience? You can unmute yourself and talk. Hello, this is Sandra. Um, Sandra. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, uh, I'm really curious about. Um, I'm really curious about what is the current, um, what is the current obstacle for you to expand or scale up? So, is it the technological issues, or it is it logistical issues? And also, um, just now you mentioned that um, this talk is about the synergy between vertical and outdoor farming. But I think uh, at the end, it's a little bit rushed. And I just wonder, is there any ongoing projects that actually combine the two or actually um, increase the um, knowledge exchange between uh, vertical farmers and tr conventional farmers? Thank you. Yep. Uh, sorry to rush <laughs> to, to to rush up the project. Uh, the the presentation. Uh, because it was almost time so for me. But uh, anyways. So before right before this talk, I was actually meeting with Rooftop Republic. I'm sure we're quite familiar with them. They have quite a few farms uh on the rooftop in Hong Kong right now. They are also trying to deploy technology into their rooftop farms. But then the main issue is wiring. There's no power in into the wiring in the rooftop. So that's one issue. That's why they can't deploy the, the technology. So what we're going to do is we're going to use our solar system combined with sensors like the solar sensors, uh, humidity, weather sensors. We're going to combine them, make a system, put on the rooftop. And we hope to deploy like 20 of them on all of on their farms. And by the end of the day, we can see all the data on a on a UI on a dashboard, and then we try can make sense of the data and see if we can utilize it uh, the 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 empty space a little bit more. So that's one thing we're going to try to do it. And because we actually try to do work with outdoor farms before, but somehow they really don't like working with us. So uh, we are trying. We're still trying. Okay, so Josephine has a follow-up question yeah. asking whether you're familiar with the concept of managing crop pest and insect problem using proper nutritional management. So you, when you change the composition of your nutrients, do it help? We we don't have a lot. So back in the days in uh, in La Fausang, in our greenhouse farm, we tried something similar, but because I think the water volume is too big in our farm, we have like thousands of liters of water. So it's really hard for, difficult for us to manage the nutrient. And also our nutrients are always based on the fish feed. So we rely on the fish feed and they generate fish waste and then they produce the nutrients. So we can't really control it. And we try to monitor the nutrients through the test kit user in aquariums. So we test, test the magnesium, phosphate, all this kind of stuff, but then 
we can't really control it. So yeah, I would like to try that. I think it's pretty interesting as well. We also tried to use an official insect, but they don't work. Uh, and then back, because back then we were USDA organic certified, we could only use the stuff that is uh, USDA certified. Uh, we had to import a, a lot of materials from the States, uh, which means there's limited choices for us. So, but yeah, I'm quite interested in that as well. Okay. So I, I do have a question myself because um, I believe that uh, you cannot replace the open end farming completely. Nope. So we'll, do you agree that uh, the indoor farming is more efficient for those uh, plants with short cycle and yeah. with a higher uh, value, sell, sell, uh, sell value so that uh, you can more close to the cities and go directly uh, to the restaurants what so so that uh, mo most time people do not grow like crops like rice we told that yeah, yeah. Low, low unit price and yet they require a long time to grow and it, the volume that is required so much that in the farming cannot afford to to use all the energy to produce yeah. to do you, yeah. that this is some something always in my mind i just yeah. want to listen to your opinion on that yeah, uh, so we know the efficiency of the farming. We are quite familiar with because I've been in the greenhouse for four years, so I know exactly how well plants can grow in uh, when there's enough sunlight, especially with a full spectrum light. Uh, we think vertical farms are suitable for high turnover greens, like leafy greens, like lettuce or herbs or something that's more fragile, something that has a lot shorter, shorter shelf life. Because whenever you import leafy greens, let's say from the States or from China, usually the shelf life is only two or three days. It means uh, wastage is really high. But by comparison, because once we harvest, we throw it in the fridge and then we ship it to the retailers or our customers, they can store it in the fridge for two to, two to three weeks without any issues at zero to four degrees. So I think this type of crops are suitable for uh, vertical farming. And on the other hand, I don't really believe in high value crops for vertical farming. Uh, that's my personal opinion. I think that's quite unrealistic uh, and that a lot of people can afford high value crops. Uh, <laughs> and then let's say you can do strawberries, right? Strawberries is high value, it's high turnover. But on the other hand, I like strawberries, okay? But then it's mostly sugar, it's carbs, right? <laughs> it's not too healthy for people on it. Uh, so I think we can stick with leafy greens for Hong Kong for vertical farming. Uh, our consumption, uh, we know the Hong Kong consumption is over 400 tons of leafy greens of, of lettuce per month easily. So it, it's going to be a long way for us to fulfill the market. Uh, so I think we can focus on leafy greens for now. Okay, so, so uh, well, maybe I follow up on this question, right? So for this vegetable leafy green, so, well, what what's the estimation that Hong Kong can uh, fulfill our own requirement? How many percent do do you, do you expect it? Like Singapore, they are pressuring for twenty percent, right? So, yeah. how about Hong Kong? So, what do you think? So, based on our business model, every ten thousand square feet of uh, in an empty factory at a ceiling of around three meters tall, we can produce six tons of lettuce per month. So, with four hundred tons of lettuce, you can roughly calculate around we have need a few hundred facilities which is doable as long as the business model is interesting thank you yeah is there, is there any other questions from the audience hello this is sandra again i'd like sandra. to follow up on the beneficial microbes which is really intriguing to me um i want to ask how did you verify with uh how do you verify the identity of the microbes and their uh, beneficial functions and also have you done any experiments to test for example um, how long does it take for the microbial community to establish this uh, beneficial equilibrium and also if you have any perturbations such as removing the biofilms then uh, does it shift to another a new equilibrium or how long does it take for uh, the microbiome to establish itself yes thank you so our testing so far is all done by ourselves uh, we work with poly to do some a little bit of small experience uh, experiments it's nothing 
very specific because even when they do the uh, mRNA testing, they realize there's like too many bacteria inside the water. They are not able to isolate it. But on the other hand, because we have independent setup in the farm, we have six, 16, 16 independent setup. Each of them, we've tried to put in different mix of bacteria. Oh, by the way, the way we do it is that we don't use aquaponics. We use hydroponics and we mix it with bacteria. I think that's because we believe that's the only way we can actually notice the differences between the plants. Because once we add in the uh, the bacteria from aquaponics, uh, it's, it's simply too chaotic. We are not able to do it. Uh, we are not able to do any really meaningful research right now because we don't have a lab, uh, but we think we can do it next year once we have more funding coming, or more fundings coming in. And other challenge is that we realize there's no probes or anything in that's available for us to check on the bacteria content in our farm. We can look at the EC content, but it's always over 3000. So it's irrelevant to us. So all we can do is we compare different setup with different bacteria mix. And uh, regarding the biofilm, we don't really remove it because it's just way too much work for us. Okay. Sorry, uh, just to quickly verify, sorry if I missed it. So you did conduct experiment to see um, whether the bacteria have growth promoting effects yep. on the crops, right? Yep, correct. I see, thank you. Yep. Okay, I guess uh, this has been a follow up comment. Uh, he's, he's inviting everybody to witness, uh, I think her practice of using a plant nutrients um, uh, form but modifying that to control the pesticides are used, or even get rid of the the pest. Yeah, right? that so, would be best. That yeah, would be the so best. That, that, I think there's a concept of regenerative farming. Yeah. So, uh, uh, well, I, yeah, if, 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 if anyone interested, you can contact uh, Josephine and take a look. Right. So sure. maybe that. I'm very interested. Trust me, we are very interested in this. I guess it will be a very good compliment, complimenting to each other. When, yeah. when, we, when we can do the one without applying any chemicals yeah. on, on open land, that's one way. And then when there are situations that you require to have short life cycle, fast, yeah. and uh, products, maybe the indoor farming is another way. If there can be a complementary solution. Yeah, uh, I think. Uh, yeah. So, I think sorry, sorry, uh, because I think that's really important as well if that's doable. Because in a lot of indoor farms, uh, the cost is actually goes to the clean room. When you set up such a big clean room, the cost is really high. Usually, clean room is used in a medical company or you manufacture mm -hmm. CPU chips and so kind of stuff, right? But when you do many do a clean room for a vegetable, for me, it doesn't make sense. But then it, when you don't have a clean room, it means it's quite likely you're gonna have pest infections. It's pretty easy to have pest infections, like. Uh, aphids, uh, mites, those kind of stuff, right? It's really easy. So yeah, if it works, I'll be very happy to help and want to see it as well. Good. So you should communicate with Josephine. Yes, sure. <laughs> please pass <laughs> me the content. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, well, ask me, I, I have all the contacts. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so any, any uh, what do you want to have comments and questions before we go to dinner or whatever? Well, I guess uh, I don't see any person raising their hand or typing in new questions and comments. So I think with that, I I would like to thank uh, the speaker then. I think it, he is sharing his uh, good experience both in the greenhouse and indoor farming. So what he tell us today is, is based on his experience and his exploration right? and, and, and an experimental station, right? Because he tried different things, formulating new things, and it just, you look like a scientist to us. <laughs> no, I'm not. I don't have a science degree. So, so you, you try different things. I think you get the empirical uh, data and try to explain it and try to apply it and modify it. I think this, uh, this is a scientific mind, innovative mind that we need for future agricultural practice. So um, uh, thank you for joining us. And thank you. Yeah, we'll announce the next talk later. It, it will be at the end of October. So we'll have another uh, October talk on uh, algorithm technology. So we, you will receive the information through email. Okay, so with that, I, I uh, 
Goodbye to everybody and uh, good night or good morning for, for those who are not in Hong Kong. Okay, bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.